You are more than welcome to this brief introduction to the Epistle of Jude for the Powellhurst Men's Thursday Morning Bible Study. Although this epistle was originally written in Greek, we shall be working from the English Standard Version of 2016. As to the background of this epistle, in about A.D. 33, Jesus foretold that false prophets would arise and seek to deceive believers. By A.D. 60, the apostles John, Peter, and Paul wrote epistles to churches warning that false teachers would seek to infiltrate their gatherings. So by A.D. 70, Jude now wrote to warn that such deceivers have come, explaining how to recognize them and to protect ourselves from them. In the second century CE, some Christian leaders disputed Jude's epistle for several reasons. First, Jude was not an apostle. Secondly, he seemed to depend upon Second Peter for much of his content. Thirdly, Jude quotes from apocryphal writings, which we shall look at in a moment, and the epistle seems quite brief. By the end of the century, however, all churches had accepted Jude into their canon, that is, into their New Testament. Jude's dependence upon Second Peter is quite clear. As this epistle was copied by scribes in the first century, and then sent around to various other countries where it was copied again and again, a few modifications occasionally were introduced into those copies. For example, in verse 1, instead of the phrase, Beloved in God, later manuscripts read, Sanctified by God. In verse 2, some later copyists inserted the word God after the phrase, Only Lord, to make a distinction with the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, ancient copyists may have confused an abbreviation for Lord, Kappa Sigma, with an abbreviation for Jesus, Iota Sigma. It was customary in ancient Christian documents and manuscripts to use abbreviations for all words related to the divine being. Exodus 12:51 does declare that it was the Lord who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. At verse 19, instead of the phrase, it is these who cause divisions, later copyists wrote, these be they who separate themselves. In verses 22 and 23, some ancient manuscripts describe three classes of sinners whilst others describe two classes by removing the second phrase, others. In verse 22, instead of the verb to show mercy, some ancient manuscripts read to convince. And then verse 25, some later copyists inserted the word wise after only, as it is written in Romans 16:27. Again in verse 25, some later copyists removed the phrase before all time from before both now and ever. Jude's orderly presentation of his content easily lends to a teaching outline of we suggest point one greeting verses one and two with three points below it. Secondly, dangers from new doctrines with three points below it. Thirdly, dangers from the past with three points below it. Fourthly, dangers from dreamers with three points below it. And five, dangers from the godless with three points. Point six, respond with truth in three points. And lastly, respond with worship in three points. As you teach through the Epistle of Jude, you will encounter a few terms that deserve explanation. For example, in verse 4, 
we're told that certain people have crept in. The Greek term is anthropos, which can include both men and women, both ethnic Jews and Gentiles. Verse 6 speaks of angels who left their first estate. In this context, angels refers to the sons of God or sons of the gods from Genesis chapter 6, who are called watchers in the book of Enoch and other Jewish literature, which Jude cites in this epistle. Verse 7, unnatural desire, is literally strange flesh, which apocryphal literature relates to desire towards angels. In verse 8, relying on their dreams employs a verb that usually pertains to having visions of a spiritual kind or religious character in both the Greek Old Testament and Greek New Testament. And then verse 23, a strange allusion to garment, Greek chiton, a garment worn next to the skin by both sexes. A few points of grammar for those who are interested in grammatical issues. In verse 1, the Greek reads literally, to the in God Father beloved and Jesus Messiah kept, called ones. The terms beloved and kept are perfect passive participles, a Greek tense that implies lasting results from an earlier action, namely their call from God to believe in Jesus. Now, the preposition in is quite unusual with passive verbs in Greek, but appropriate in such a compact sentence. In verse 4, the grammar of the phrase, the only Master and Lord, indicates that Master and Lord are the same person. In your teaching and preaching from the Epistle of Jude, you would do well to underscore several of the historic Christian doctrines that appear in this epistle. We think in particular the doctrine of God, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, apostolic authority, predictive prophecy, everlasting salvation, divine judgment, angels and devils. A few comments about this epistle. Jude, the, the Greek says Judas, it is a convention in Western languages to call him Jude, to distinguish him from two apostles who were named Judas. Now, both James and Jude were physical brothers of Jesus. When Jude calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ, he may be showing humility, but at the same time, the servant of an important figure or Lord had a much higher rank than did most freemen. Thus, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ is a high-ranking member of the Christian community. Now, throughout this epistle, Jude is quite fond of trilogies, sets of three ideas. For example, Christians are called to eternal life, compare verse 21. They are loved by God the Father, and they are kept by Jesus Christ. Compare verse 24. Another trilogy concerns mercy, peace, and love. In verse 3, the term saints, which literally means holy ones, probably refers to Jesus' apostles, where even Jude appeals to apostolic authority in verse 17 rather than to his own. In verse 4, marked out for this judgment is a Greek perfect tense verb meaning written beforehand. Now, where was that written? One lively possibility has been found in the Dead Sea Scroll IQS section 4 verses 9 through 14. In verse 5, there are three examples of wicked beings whom God has judged. First, Faithless Israelites, after their exodus from Egypt, fallen angels who fathered the Nephilim, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, known for their perverted immorality. In verse 5, 
the oldest manuscripts read Jesus, whereas others read the Lord. Although Exodus 12.51 says, The Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, since early Christians believed that Jesus was the Lord in human flesh, they could also speak of Jesus as Lord over ancient Israel. In verse 6, angels. According to the Book of Enoch and other ancient Jewish literature, these angels were the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, who fathered the Nephilim with human women. And in verse 9, Michael, the devil, and the body of Moses. The origin of this Jewish myth has been lost, though some early Christians said that they had read it in a document titled The Assumption of Moses. That document was written in Hebrew, translated into Greek, and eventually into Latin. A fragment of the Latin version has been found, but not the section containing this story. In verse 11, we are introduced to three Bible stories, which you do well to read for yourselves and to comment on in your teaching. The story of Cain, who killed his brother, from Genesis chapter 4, whose sin was disbelief. The false prophet Balaam, from Numbers 22, who is known for his avarice, accepting money to pronounce false prophecies. And then Korah, who in Numbers 16, rebelled against the authority of Moses. In verses 14 and 15, Jude quotes from the book of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 9. Now Christians used to read this book, even though they never accepted it as scripture. I recommend that you get a copy and read through it. You will be glad that it's not part of your Bible. Verse 17, the apostles who had warned about such men coming into the church included Peter who wrote, Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And Paul wrote, In the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. The last verses of Jude summarize 14 points of standard Christian theology on dealing with our Christian walk, 10 practices, and 4 points of worship. You are invited to gather with us in the Powellhurst Men's Bible Study this coming Thursday morning, either in person or here online through video streaming. In either case, we have an assignment for you. Please try to read through the book of Jude once a day this week in different translations. Jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in our Bible study group. If you feel inclined, you may undertake a project in behalf of the entire gathering. If you complete a project, then we shall post it online for others to download. You may collaborate with others, of course. Perhaps draft up a two-column list of parallel verses between Second Peter and Jude. Or compile a list of parallel verse references and texts from the First Testament, from the New Testament, and from non-biblical sources that are quoted in Jude. A third idea, work out a set of lesson plans from Jude, which you might teach to others. And then someone may write up a biblical theology of doctrines found in the epistle of Jude. If you do pastoral work, then meet with your coach or with those whom you coach and talk together about ways in which to teach seekers and believers from the epistle of Jude, and then agree together on a plan to do so.